and gentlemen, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's the main event, Mark's podcast, now on the Unhinged Sports Network. I am your first co-host, lifelong wrestling fan, former radio guy, cat dad, Troy. And with me, as always, is the WWE Walking Wrestling Encyclopedia, the main event collector, and the Michael Shane, the my Frankie Kazarian. He's Greg. What's up, Greg? Uh, what's up? Again, I get the horrible one. I liked Michael Shane. Okay, all right, all right, all right. The lesser of the two. Well, okay. Uh, I, that one, that one is perfectly acceptable to say because he, I shouldn't have said there's that no one. debate. I, I'm not okay. But yeah. Frankie Kazarian is just awesome. Well, hey. Ooh, by the way, does he ever freaking age? <laughs> no, what the not hell? really. I know he's in that same boat as like Charles Robinson and uh, I'm thinking Billy somebody Gunn, else. Gunn? Yeah, Billy Gunn. I might yeah. even say partially Dustin Rhodes. <laughs> Yeah, well, Dustin is, like, aging in reverse. I mean, not his face, but, like, his his body is, like, no. holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell, man? If I had found one thing about AEW to be good, is maybe they have, like, the Fountain of Youth over there or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, well, you know, Charles Robinson has been keeping it under lock and key for so long. <laughs> Especially with that hair, man. I know, right? Second best but, hair in the biz. <laughs> but, yeah, the reason we bring up Frankie Kazarian and... Of all people, Michael Shane, a.k.a. Matt Bentley. Uh, we're talking about TNA from 2005 today, and we're not yeah. doing it on a bonus show. We didn't uh, get off course by um, because of uh, – ra- sorry, we didn't get off course randomly. <laughs> yeah, right. I always try to stay, you know, current or, you know, with, with the show, with my, uh, ana- you know, uh, names at the beginning of the show there, so – uh, my comparisons, whatever. So and now that we talk, now they mention the year too. I'm like, wow, Kazarian's still wrestling 16 years later and still looks amazing. Yeah, he was wrestling before Crazy. this too. Yeah, two people from SCU were on the show and are that's still right, wrestling. Yeah. That's right. Not yeah. uh, Christopher Daniels. That's the other one I was thinking of. Found the Fountain of Youth. Like, Dude, yeah, seriously, I think he peaked at like 25 and then just stayed there. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna get into against all odds today. There's not a whole lot as far as like, uh, you know, if you want a comprehensive review of something TNA related from 05, a lot of people weren't talking about it back then. I know. Uh, you know, it's funny because I think we had talked. I told you this off air, too. I think this is their best year ever. Personally, I, I think it's up there. I like 2006 a lot. No, I mean, they had some good years, but as far yeah. as like great um, shows go, nothing yeah. beats 05, in my opinion. We'll talk about some of that. I think it. Suffered from some of the WCW hangover syndrome, uh, and, and I'll get into my opinions as to why uh, as we get into the show. But there's definitely a lot to talk about. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so as far as news, there's only a handful of stories. They're big ones, so, you know, we'll, we'll take our time with them. But kind of like uh, if anybody listened to the bonus show from this Freaking past bonus. Friday on uh, No Way Out from 06 – there's not a whole lot of news, but there's some big stories that we'll kind of drag out and, you know, really dig into. But we'll do all of that on the other side of this break. Uh, and before we get into all that, I do want to say that we are sponsored by Fubo TV and Fanatics. In the podcast description, you will find the links to click on. Fubo TV has over 100 channels and on-demand sports and all that good stuff. So if that's your thing, you should definitely click on that and let them know that we sent you. And Fanatics... Greg is a personal shopper there. He just bought you know, a few Oakland A's things. Yeah. So if you're a big sports fanatic, then fanatics is the way to go. Also important to note, too, it's not just like shirts and stuff and jerseys. It's like other cool accessories. I'm not going to run it down. You go, go see. But it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah, you they've know? got a lot of a lot of great stuff uh, up there at Fanatics. And as far as Fubo goes, uh, I mean, I'm looking. It kind of goes by area, how many channels you got. But just for... You know, putting that out there, it's not just sports. Right now, they've got 220 channels available in my area, including stuff like Disney Channel, Fox Business, uh, HGTV, my local news, and, you know, all the way from, yeah, Dayton down to Cincinnati. Good Lord. They've got, you know, the FX channels, all that good stuff. So check it out. Like I said, and there's obviously sports. It's on demand, 100 plus channels, live and on demand, cloud DVR included. You start a free trial today fubo tv click on the links below and we will come right back after this break with all the news and notes from february of 05 
Follow the Main Event Marks at Facebook.com forward slash Main Event Marks Pod, on Twitter at Main Event underscore Marks, and on Instagram at Main Event underscore Marks and at Main Event Collector. It's the very best of professional wrestling's past every Monday on Retro Wrestling Review. I'm your host, Troy, and together we'll hop on my time-traveling wrestling ring and watch along to the greatest matches from yesteryear in the sport of kings. As complex, as controversial, and as brilliant, really, as he is. On Triple R, we'll cover matches from across the world, including American territories, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Fast action, lots more than that. You'll learn some things, find out about wrestlers and matches you never even knew about, and we'll have some laughs. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Retro Wrestling Pod. Retro Wrestling Review is available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, served up fresh every Monday morning. Unbelievable! The crowd! Absolutely stunned! The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. News and notes time. This first one is straight out of WWE. Brock Lesnar filed a lawsuit against WWE. The suit claims that they prevented him from earning a living in wrestling due to a no-compete clause that he agreed to last year when WWE offered to give him an early contract release. The state or the worldwide clause rather prevents Lesnar from working for any professional wrestling or professional fighting promotions. The contract does not expire until June 30th of 2010. Do you remember when all this was going down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He I just, like, I never bad an eye. You signed it, dude. Now you don't get to sit there and cry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was like, I want to go play foosball. And that didn't exactly work out for him. Uh, you know, I mean, it had predictable results. I mean, I don't know. I kind of rooted for him on one hand. On the other hand, I was like, dude, you've been a wrestler your whole life. That doesn't always translate to, well, I can do anything. It usually goes the other way. <laughs> yeah, right. So he went. He, I mean, he made it onto the practice squad of the Vikings for a minute. So that was probably I, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that was for, more for press than anything. <laughs> so uh, but yeah, he sued WWE after he failed out of football. You know, obviously he wasn't thinking ahead. So, but I, I know for a fact that, you know, something came about of this. They kind of uh, backed down because he did pop up in New Japan for a while. And then obviously he went to UFC. So I won a title on both spots. Yeah, right. Uh, a lot of people don't remember. Uh, Brock Lesnar was a former IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. Oh, he, JBL remembers. He used to beat us over the head with that fact. Good for you. Yeah, and then. He actually faced Kurt Angle. I I want to say he yeah he he lost the title to Kurt Angle when Angle was in TNA, but New Japan does not recognize that. By the way, they kind of just skip over that. They act like Lesnar vacated the title. That was it. Kind of like Jason Thunder Liger losing that one on Nitro. <laughs> yeah, uh, it didn't happen. I know you all saw it, but it didn't happen. Bro, it happened, bro. He kinda lost. Like those... He got hit in the head with a ball of tequila, bro. Kid Green. Yeah, this happened, by the way. Uh, another story here. This one is pretty, pretty depressing about a guy from yesteryear. But by the way, we're going to keep a, a running tally. I don't know if it's we're going to cover WrestleMania eight next week. I don't know if this is still going to hold up, uh, but two shows in a row, if you count the, the bonus w- with no death. Hmm. I don't think I, there will be any death around WrestleMania eight. Yeah, uh, well, hey, we'll we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> if it's out there, I'll find it. Wow. But, well, that's, something always, that's something to aim for. <laughs> we always start to show off a death. So it's nice that two weeks in a row, uh, we don't. We have a lawsuit this week, but no death. But this one is depressing, though. Uh, Lex Luger was arrested this month alongside a Georgia interstate highway and charged with DUI with additional counts of driving with an expired tag, alteration of a tag, no proof of insurance, and an open container in the car. Uh, Luger was spotted on the side of I-575 near Woodstock, Georgia. A Cobb County officer forced him to, or rather found him, passed out and slumped over the steering wheel of his vehicle. Well, you know, if a Cobb County officer finds you, you're going to be serving hard time. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, you beat me to it. All right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when, when Luger woke up, he drove away, prompting the officer to call for assistance. Before he could be stopped, however, Luger struck another vehicle. Fortunately, no one was badly injured. Luger was on his way home from a wrestling convention in Tampa, and he told police that his last drink had been about seven hours earlier. But police found a partially consumed bottle of vodka in the SUV before taking him to jail. Wow. Aye. This is uh, probably not the worst thing he's ever been busted for, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, not a good one, but this was a bad time in Lex Luger's life yeah, for many reasons. And yeah, you can sit there and say it was all self-inflicted. I get that, but it, it's still not good. And it, it's nice to see, even though he's in a bad way physically now, I mean, emotionally and, and everything, it seems like he pulled the nose up. And he's doing pretty well now. He seems pretty well grounded. Uh, so, I don't know. Good for Lex. This was awful, though. But keeping up with another thing that was, uh, you know, bad for his life at this time was, uh, well, it's been nearly 21 months since the passing of Miss Elizabeth and the subsequent ju- drug charges. An Atlanta judge gave Lex Luger five years probation after the wrestler pleaded guilty to possession of three kinds of steroids. He was also ordered to pay a $1,000 fine and submit to drug tests. Man, it just gets better and better. Yeah, I know. This, man, I I never would have thought. I mean, you know, think back to when you were a kid watching the Macho Man and, and Miss Elizabeth and everything. Never would you have thought, you know, uh, well, it says 21 months. So, oh, three she passed. And, you know, you're sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, she's going to dry or die of a drug overdose. Nope. Like, that's nuts. I realize it's wrestling, but still, like, she wasn't a wrestler. And, you know, it's not like she was, you know, bodybuilding or anything like that. I don't know. And she was always the clean cut, you know, Miss Elizabeth. And then she dies of drug overdose with Lex Luger. Is that the story of Hollywood, though? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And the the whole with Lex Luger thing just shocks me still to this day. It's like you go from Randy Savage to, to Lex Luger. I don't know. I did was getting off on a on a less uh, depressing note about Macho Man and uh, women. I laughed at was uh, Conan and, and Disco Inferno were talking about Macho Man on uh, Keeping It 100 their podcast. And so uh, somebody brought up Macho Man with the ladies and and, and Disco was like he's kind of awkward and. Conan was like, dude, he was super awkward. He said he had no game with the ladies. He would be at the hotel bar half in his gimmick. Like, who the <laughs> hell does that? <laughs> and he said, and then Hogan half the times would join him also half in gimmick. Like, he's like, dude, it was super corny. <laughs> uh, apparently, Macho well, Man if was anybody just knows awkward. corny, it's disco. <laughs> hey, I wonder if he showed up at the bar wearing his disco <laughs> outfit. And, where, and got his pompadour rocket. Man, that was... You're, you're, you're insinuating that he goes out without that on ever. I hope he runs his strip club with while wearing that. Like, when he comes in, they're like, and now, coming into the, <laughs> into the club that is sounds like the worst, Inferno. That sounds like the worst stripper ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, and now, the owner of the club, Glenn Gilberti. And then they play Disco Fever, and he just, like, dances in <laughs> into the club. I want him to, like, change his legal name to Disco. With a Q. Got to be with a Q. Hell yes. <laughs> and then he dresses like Cisco and in that uh, music video. Good grief. The music video, by the way. He only ever had one. All right, last story here. I told you it was going to be a short one. On Monday Night Raw, WWE announced that Roddy Piper would be joining the likes of Bob Orton, Paul Orndorff, Jim, uh, Jimmy Hart, the Iron Sheik, and Nikolai Volkov as being inducted into the 2005 WWE Hall of Fame. I'm not even being sarcastic here. Every single name I just mentioned is what pops into my head when I think of the Golden Era. Yep. Like, they had, that they is had announced Hogan, class. Right? I thought it was funny that he was the last one they announced that year. Wasn't he the head, like, quote-unquote, the head of the class, too? Yeah, when he was, yeah. like, a couple weeks before WrestleMania, I believe. And what's funny is, well, I mean, that... Hulk Hogan, I mean, that that fits perfectly with that that class right there. But what I find funny is, like, they they save him for last. It's like, well, the head of the class, you know, we're the best for last. We're announcing him. Now it's like whoever's leading the class, they announce him first. They're like leading the 
whatever class, you know, WWE class of whatever year is this guy. And then we'll announce everybody else later. And it's like, usually the last one is kind of like, oh, yeah, that guy. I <laughs> guess he deserves it. So like, have, have, we, uh, have we checked all our boxes this year? We got somebody who's dead. We got our one woman and we got our minority. Cool. We're good. And a tag team. Oh, yeah. Got to get a tag team in there. Uh, induct somebody twice. Is that are, are we giving somebody their second ring yet? That's become that's a how, thing. That's how Booker got his second ring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're not going to induct just Stevie Ray. So. Stevie effing Ray. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could. But what are you going to do in his like in his uh, build up package or his uh, highlight package? I mean, it's obviously going to be all Harlem heat and then him yelling suck his guts to know. Oh, you can put him in the NWO. Yeah, but and they'll have to crop, you know, Virgil or excuse me, Vincent and uh, Brian Adams and all of them out of the picture. You know, the, all the B team. I mean, that's the A squad, dude. If you're gonna put put CB Ray in, you got to put Vincent and Brian Adams and Horace Hogan. That that was the the new black and white. Yeah, the, they even got the, their own theme song. Yeah, what the hell you're talking about? Those were the guys that came out to do the run-ins. And Scott Norton, too, by the way. No, I just mean the the, the NWO when after the finger poke of doom. Oh, God. Like, the black and white stayed those four. <sighs> yeah. Oh, dude, that yeah. was amazing. Right, yeah. That's uh, it's like the revival of the Four Horsemen that lasted for a couple weeks. <laughs> Which one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we're going to take our... Our next break here, that was, that's the end of the news. Like I said, we're keeping it short this week. We're going to dive into the event at hand. we got a lot to cover with this show, oddly enough. So some matches more than others, some segments more than others. But all in all, there's a lot to talk about. I will say, uh, if any of you have, if you're first-time listeners, we keep it somewhat clean to the point of where, like, we don't curse a lot. And when we do curse, I if it's something that, you know, wouldn't fly on TV, I bleep it out. So I am going to curse about certain things on the show, just because it just uh, the show is, as a whole was pretty good, I think. But there are certain things on the show that I feel need extra emphasis. You know, uh, sentence enhancers, we'll say. Can I say so, ass? Oh, absolutely. Well, there's a certain person on the show that absolutely deserves that word. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get into that. But real quick, before we uh, dive into the break, just letting you know, uh, we are still on the Unhinged Network, or Sports Network, and if you're not listening to us on the Unhinged Sports Network, you should. UnhingedSN.com or unhinged.airtime.pro. You can hear us every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's right when NXT and AEW Dynamite launch. And also, we have a replay if you're listening to us on Wednesday and you didn't catch the whole thing, you want to catch the replay. Tomorrow, Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time is the next time we play. we got replays all throughout the week. Keep up with us on social media. But we're going to take our next break. When we come back, it's against all odds. Follow the Main Event Marks at Facebook.com forward slash Main Event Marks pod, on Twitter at Main Event underscore Marks, and on Instagram at Main Event underscore Marks, and at Main Event Collector. It's the very best of professional wrestling's past every Monday on Retro Wrestling. Review. I'm your host, Troy, and together we'll hop on my time-traveling wrestling ring and watch along to the greatest matches from yesteryear in the sport of kings. As complex, as controversial, and as brilliant, really, as he is. On Triple R, we'll cover matches from across the world, including American territories, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Fast action, lots more than that. You'll learn some things, find out about wrestlers and matches you never even knew about, and we'll have some laughs. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Retro Wrestling Pod. Retro Wrestling Review is available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, served up fresh every Monday morning. Unbelievable! The crowd absolutely stunned! Main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we're back diving into TNA against all odds. Oh, five. The date, February 13th, 2005. It took place at the TNA impact zone in Orlando, Florida. So the attendance 
you know, had to be a chart busting 775 people. <laughs> you can't even call it a sellout either because the tickets free. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, for pay per views, I don't know. I'm, well, I'm assuming, sure they were. Yeah, they if they weren't, they I guarantee they gave quite a few comps. So, but uh, yeah, so the pay per view buy rates they didn't. Somebody got into an argument with me years ago about this with, uh, you know, they were big WWE fans. They used to argue with me about this. And I was like, look, their numbers aren't great. OK, I get it. But they're like, well, the rumors online say that they got. And I'm like, they're not a publicly traded company, so they don't officially have to tell you what their numbers are. Like, you know what I mean? What the Internet said. <laughs> yeah. They're like, well, this website who constantly bashes on TNA said that they only did this many. I'm like. It's not official. They don't announce it. Well, they have to. No, they don't have to announce it. Well, what did but, Uncle Dave say? Yeah, he's he's the authority, man. But according to the closest thing I could find for buy rates on the internet, they said it's somewhere between fifteen to twenty thousand. Which obviously, yeah, which obviously sucks. But I mean, they were still they were around what? This was their third, fourth year, I think, third year. Yeah, but this is uh, let's see, November, December. This is only their fourth three-hour pay-per-view. Yeah, so we reviewed. I think we, yeah, we reviewed their first uh, yeah. three-hour pay-per-view last year. What what was that show? Victory Road. Victory Road. Okay, oh uh, oh four. <laughs> so go check that out. It is now in the archives. It also had Jeff Hardy and Jeff Jarrett going for the NWA title in the main event, and it involved Kevin Nash and all that. So they're still there. My favorite thing that I forgot about from this era was seeing the – and this was before he started calling in the creatures of the night. You see the people in the front row. There's always two or three of them dressed up like Jeff Hardy. Yeah, he was the easiest to cosplay. Yeah. So obviously there were some dedicated fans, and usually it was the same uh, – let's call them androgynous uh, people in the front row. Androgynous, like pal. Every single week. Uh, so, what? Well, yeah. It was usually that. The show opens with, uh, well, I mean, the show actually opens with Epic Voice Guy from the old TNA vignettes. Who just passed, that, by the way. Yeah, it wasn't that too sucks. long ago. Yeah, he had a great voice. He, I always loved his intros for TNA. And of course, you know, we get to, we made fun of it on the last, you know, Victory Road show. But, uh, you know, they had to show their random, uh, like, B roll footage of satellites in a desert and whatever. Like, I never no. understood that because, like, yeah. it didn't take place in Vegas or, like, Mexico or something, you know, where there are deserts. I mean, um, I guess that they want to show, you know, satellites, hey, we're broadcasting, you know, whatever. But, like, eh? they, they showed a lot of desert footage. So I didn't get that one. But I don't know. But they, they start off with that. And then we go to Mike Tanay and Don West before sending it back to Shane Douglas and Larry Zabisco outside of Jeff Jarrett's locker room. And Scott Norton is outside of Kevin Nash's locker room. Yeah, we're setting up for the main event. I'll get into all the uh, intricacies of sorry. that. I'm sorry, you said Scott Norton. <laughs> Wait, who, uh, Scott Hudson. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, Scott Scott Norton was not in TNA. Although he, I wouldn't I wouldn't put that past him. I don't understand why he wasn't. But remember, that's like God, uh, he, Japan. I'm not even being funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, Jeff Jarrett probably didn't see any money in him, you know, because you know Jeff Jarrett knows how to draw money. <laughs> Well, he broke a thousand guitars and drew a couple of dimes. And you, no, he never drew a dime. God dang it, Greg. You're messing it up. All right. I First put match. a twist on it. Speaking, yeah. Uh, Rest in peace to Mike Graham. Yeah. Speaking of uh, never drawing dimes, by the way, uh, I'm joking. Good Lord. I don't like it when you start with that because <laughs> I know Petey, what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Petey Williams with Coach Scott Demore. Ha! Uh, taking on primetime. What the hell was that? I never understood that, by the way. You told me it was a hockey thing. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because right. I asked you, I was, I was like, why the right. hell did he always do that at the camera? And you're like, ah, it's a hockey thing. I'm like, I completely, forgot, I completely forgot I knew that. Yeah. You're the hockey guy here. Hey, it's early, okay? <laughs> yeah, not for me. But any... Shut the hell up. <laughs> I don't know how those time zones work. <laughs> well, see, whatever it is for you, subtract three hours. There you go. Well, What's ah, the day, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this was uh, for the number one contendership for the TNA X Division title. It went just shy of eight minutes. The match ends with Skipper reversing the Canadian Destroyer with the sudden death, which was the air raid crash. 
uh, for the pinfall win. And it was not bad. I kind of liked how Skipper reversed, uh, because the whole thing was PD kept going for the Canadian Destroyer, and Skipper kept reversing it. So that was pretty cool. I did not expect to see Primetime win this one. I'll say this right off the bat. Uncle Dave did not give star ratings to a lot of the show. I don't know why. He just didn't for a lot of the show. I don't know why we're reviewing it then. Yeah. Uh, So I'm using 411 Mania. If anybody uh, knows anything about them, I'll give them a shout out, 411mania.com. Uh, they gave it two stars. I gave it two and a half for average. What say you? I gave it two. I I, I love both fine. these guys. And I was like, man, this could have been way better. It definitely could have. Uh, yeah, it wasn't one of their best efforts, but it was fine. Also, it bears mentioning that the Kenny Destroyer is still one of the greatest, if not the greatest finishers in the history of pro wrestling. Yeah, and they've bastardized it so much on the indie scene. Oh, it looks cool, and we can flip. Yeah, you've ruined it. But Adam yeah, Cole Canadian... does it the best, so let's just keep that. Oh, for sure. It but went yeah. from Canada to Panama City. <laughs> <laughs> Nuts, right? But uh, speaking of not their best effort, we now get a recap of the former NASCAR driver Jeff Hammond. He's joining up with three live crew of <laughs> all effing people to feud with. Uh, see, I put Matt Bentley. He's a feud with Michael Shane and Frankie Kazarian. What uh, is it with other wrestling companies that need to team up with NASCAR? Uh, what am I missing? WCW there, oh. did it, too. Oh, yeah. Well, that's good old Southern wrestling, Greg. So, I mean, I guess I TNA was based in Florida at the time. And, you know, Daytona's yeah. there. I, I get it. but And they, well, and before this, they were in Tennessee. So, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense. But th- I thought they were trying to get away from the Southern fried wrestling. But this was all kinds of wrestling. God, you want people like to call wrestling fake a sport. How, how about NASCAR? Oh, man. Good lord. Steering I mean, away they, from that. They really make quickly. some they make some serious left turns. Okay, anyways, uh Good grief. It, th- this whole thing, by the way, Jeff Hammond, for whatever reason, I don't know if he was a broadcaster in NASCAR first, but he became a broadcaster randomly for TNA. I guess he liked wrestling and they offered him a job. So <laughs> But he He's was a, probably called a wrestling too. <laughs> I guarantee he did. But they offered him a day. But he was a. Uh, oh, sorry. He, he was part of the broadcast team for TNA. Uh, I know he commentated for Explosion. I want to say for a while. And wasn't that like that, only on their site? Yeah, yeah, it was. So he was part of the broadcast team for that, and then randomly he starts training to wrestle. I don't know why, but he does. And the three live crew of all people are going to be the ones to train him. You know, well, I mean, you know, all jokes aside, you know, being trained by road dog is probably a good thing. Yeah. Road dog and Conan, I would say our truth at the time was still fairly young. Uh, he's another truth, one, by the truth way. Now, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say yes. Yeah. What, I mean, I know he's, he's I know he uses a joke with the 24 seven title. People forget he's a damn good wrestler, but he definitely is. Well, he was another one, by the way. You know, we're talking about people who, you know, found the fountain of youth. Yeah, uh, dude is dude is fifty. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't look much older than he does right here huh? in 05. Either way, uh, Jeff is being trained to, to to wrestle, and he uses an elbow drop as a finisher, where he pretends to drive left around the <laughs> ring, <laughs> and then hits a jumping elbow, which he calls the pit stop. And I thought to this day the worm was the worst finisher in history. <laughs> yeah. At least okay. the worm like look cool. This guy looked like an idiot on the on the playground like in high school. <laughs> yeah, he literally like he would put his arm he would put his hands up like he's grasping a wheel and, and like cock his head to the side and turn his hands and like shuffle around the ring left and then jump and drop the elbow. Uh, the epitome I, of every nerdy white guy you've ever seen, by the way. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. <laughs> yep. And the name Pit Stop, by the way, wasn't that what what the Nasty Boys called their move? in It WWF? is. Yeah. It is. Well, then, it wasn't th- their move, to be fair. It's just something they did. Yeah, Unless I know. It was their meant, finisher. When I hear their move, I just think of finisher, but yeah. It's... Right. Uh, but yeah, they did. Did they did they change it in WCW to Pity City? or did Maybe they... Shivani did, but I feel like they still call it the Pit Stop. Ah, okay. But anyway, that leads into this tag team match. Michael Shane and Frankie Kazarian taking on BG James and Jeff Hammond. 
with Ronda Truth Killings and Conan in their corner. I just want to point he, out that they teamed him with the right guy. <laughs> absolutely. No disrespect to the other two. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're going to team the NASCAR guy up with somebody, do it with the, you know, the Southern white guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who probably loved him. Like, he legitimately. Probably probably like yeah, he, probably, <laughs> he probably walked up and he was like, Jeff Hammond, my God, can I get your autograph? I just watched you. <laughs> he probably this marked is like out right too. after Daytona started, I believe. Like, like NASCAR season begins in February. Uh, well, I know because I know you were having a party last week with Daytona 500. But um, so it's yeah. probably after that. Yeah, well, I have a I have a good friend who watched Daytona 500, but uh, that's side the point. I knock it, but if people like it, they like it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know. And if and for all of you that we haven't chased off or Greg hasn't chased off with their with his hate of NASCAR, if you do I don't like hate NASCAR, it. I just don't like it. There is a difference. Well, for any of you who do like NASCAR uh, and haven't been chased off yet, on the Unhinged Sports Network, there are plenty of good NASCAR podcasts, by the way, that actually really get into it and know their stuff. So yeah, go check them out. But this uh, this match went for five and a half minutes. My God, uh, Michael Shane and Frankie Gazarian, by the way, they're mocking Jeff Hammond, but they're Be- wearing best, da- best part of the match, by the way. <laughs> they're mocking Hammond, but at the same time, they're wearing Daytona 500 shirts. So I'm like, is that in I- ironic fashion? Or like, I didn't totally I was like, get. it's either like Shane McMahon when he used to wrestle people. Remember, you always wore their shirts, or they were legally required to promote it. <laughs> One of the two. Yeah. Well, the the wearing the shirt would make more sense if they like like how Shane did, where he put like X Punk over X Pac and whatever. Yeah. And like this one, no, they just straight up wore Daytona 500 shirts. I'm like, were they free? And you just wanted to wear a shirt to the ring? Uh, I'm gonna stick with they were trying to promote it. I did think it was funny that on the back of the three LK jerseys, they it said Pit Crew, but it was spelled K R U, like three live crew. So well, I thought that was. Are funny. we gonna acknowledge that they're just ripping off Mortal Kombat, by the way? Yeah. Uh, and in BG, uh, BG James's opening remarks of the match, by the way, he makes a lot of racing puns talking about putting them into the wall and all this other stuff. Yeah, I didn't like that because it just brought back memories of um, Dale Earnhardt. It's like, oh, we could have avoided that one, but whatever. See, when I think of putting them in the wall, I think of uh, Tony Stewart. But wow. that, I, I was, think of uh, Berlin and the wall in WCW. Anyways, good grief. I was thinking I, I like the wall. Shut up. I can't remember what. What uh, comedian it was was talking about his his dad was a a NASCAR fan and and he he tricked out his uh, his lawnmower like uh, Tony Stewart's car and he was like well and you know just like Tony when the when the neighbor was out mowing his lawn he had to put him into the wall. So. <laughs> My white anyway. friend is not even that white. <laughs> uh, mine is. But in the end, a double team move by Shane and Kazarian backfires. This allows Hammond to finish Kazarian off with a pit stop and a pin. Frankie drew, drew short straw on this one, man. But I said this one sucked, and the crowd was not even into it. Uh, 411 Mania gave it a fourth of a star. I just gave it an even star, let's say you. Whole thing sucked. One star. Um, I, ironic that you quote him. <laughs> the guy that from was, Alabama. That was not a, legit, that is not a setup. I swear, I just came out. Oh, wow. You quoted Sparky Plug. How about that? That was, I swear to you, I didn't even think about that. I would not put that together until you just said that. Well, yeah, uh, I like almost everybody in this match, so it was hard to give a dud to because I think three, obviously, of these guys are very talented. But uh, you know what, I, you know what I think would have been even funnier here is if they allowed Jeff Hammond to do the yo yo yo, let me speak on this. Good lord, <laughs> that might have bumped my rating up a little bit. I would have <laughs> lost it laughing. Oh man, is uh. Yeah, Conan was still de- – I I didn't even think about how awesome that verbal pairing was until just now. Like, Conan and Road Dog, man, you put them together. I they, I, yeah, I loved 3 Live Crew, honestly. They I did, too. Great. Yeah. I do think that at some point, though, it became a running gag whenever, like, faces were getting beat down. Oh, where's 3 Live Crew to come help the faces? Because that was always a thing. Like, yeah. even, at the, even go back to uh, Victor Road that we reviewed at the end. Like, why the hell did 3 Live Crew get involved? Yeah, nothing to do with it, but the faces were getting beat up. So. Because they're because they're the goodest of good guys. No, yeah, and I I get it, but it's like man, overexposure <laughs> much. Right, and I mean you got the guy who who's got the the whole you know on the mic pre match shtick from WWE and WCW. You put them together, and you got K Quick. So he was clearly the worker of the three at that point because I mean Road Dog is still good. Don't get me wrong. And Conan at one point was a pretty good worker, but at this point he was, you know, I honest. think Road Dog coming off of his stint with drugs 
you could tell, you know. Yeah, he was I hate still to saying he, that because I'm a huge fan of his to this day, but you can tell he was coming off of it because he bloated up. Oh, well, yeah, he put on some weight and it, he looked hella weird when he cut his hair, but it, I got used to it after a while. But he he was still pretty damn good in the ring, man. I, I don't I think he ever shocked. lost it, but you can tell he lost a step, but he never lost it. Right. Uh, not like, I mean, and I didn't think he sucked for his WWE return either, but he, I mean, it wasn't his thing. Billy, Clearly Billy the Gunn was carrying the team. <laughs> right. Yeah. But anyway, I'll you, man. to the back now, uh, the, stipu- <laughs> the stipulation of the main event is that if, if Jeff Jarrett uses a guitar at all in the main event, he will be stripped of the NWA title and it will go to Kevin Nash. So now Jarrett's attorney confronts Dusty Rhodes about this, telling him, that he needs to eliminate the stipulation. Dusty basically tells him to go piss up a rope, and the guy leaves. Also, Threat of authority, baby. I'm getting to <laughs> getting to that. Like Dusty Rhodes is Dusty Rhodes's office is literally the back of his pickup truck, filled with bales of hay, sitting in the parking lot <laughs> with a sign that says "Office of the Director of Authority" on the tailgate. He also, <laughs> for for some reason, has a half naked Ter- uh, Tracy Brooks and Trinity dressed like cowgirls, sitting in the back of the truck. Now, that part I didn't complain about. Now, I will say this, though. You know, this office is, like, so apropos for him. I think to make Foley when he was a commissioner, like, in the laundry room and all that, it was just yeah. a running joke. This, yeah. I can believe, was probably, like, something he would do. I'm just like, really? Like, oh, he's a big hick, so he's going to fill up the bed of his pickup truck with hay for reasons, and then he's just going to sit in the parking lot doing, you know, office work in his truck all day. For what? reasons. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, what the frick? And don't get me wrong, I, I did not have a problem with seeing Tracy Brooks and Trinity in those cowgirl outfits. However, you're going to take Tracy Brooks, who is from Canada, Ontario, Canada, not even the part of Canada that has, you know, legitimate cowboys, which, oddly enough, there is there are parts of Canada that have cowboys. Uh but she's from St. Mary's, Ontario, Canada. And then you're going to take Trinity, who's a hardcore New Yorker. Hardcore Italian, I think, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like I guess let's go hand in hand. But... Yeah, dark-skinned Italian, like very swarthy uh, New Yorker. And she's she's got the thick accent. Like, hey, forget about it. You know, kind of Italian. And I don't or, think that's you know, a gimmick, by the way. No, it is not. So, it, But you're going to dress those two up. I mean, I guess their options were limited. But what about, my other that one girl from the old, the old uh, weekly pay per view days, uh, Goldilocks. She wasn't there. Uh, I think she was gone at that point. I feel like Her she might have fit in this role. Was it? What was the other one? Was it a lollipop? Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, that was the one that got her top ripped off on pay per view. Bro, we're gonna put them in stripper cages, bro. Yeah, that was something. But my other question is: this, another reason why this gimmick wouldn't fly in 2021 is because people would be like. So what, is, like, what are they getting paid to do? Is Dusty literally paying them to sit around and, and look hot? Like, that's so demeaning. <laughs> I mean, especially whatever. now when women matter in wrestling. Yeah, I know. These two women were not, you know, great wrestlers. Trinity had a match on the last pay per view we re- we reviewed, by the way. Uh, and uh, was also in WWE's yeah. ECW for a minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, wearing as little as possible. Not complaining, just pointing it out. But anyway, we now get a video recapping Raven and Dustin Rhodes' feud happening because Dustin saved Cassidy Riley. There's a blast from the past uh, from getting brutalized by Raven. Uh, you remember, Greg, when the whole finger snapping gimmick was, you know, they actually sold it like it hurt. Yeah, Pete Dunn's bringing it back. Sort of. But I mean, he snaps the fingers, but then you see like somebody will take their hand and like pop it back into place like, oh, it just it's a minor. I guess you didn't see takeover. <laughs> Oh, did did they actually like make well, it? Well, Balor then? couldn't even pose after it. Like his whole hands looked like freaking claws. Ah, nice. Like that All scene right. in Friends where Chandler's hand was like stuck to a clock for playing Pac-Man for twelve hours. <laughs> wow. That's what, that's what his hands looked like at the end of Takeover. Good grief. Well, that's good. Yeah, because Marty Marty Skrull bastardized the hell out of that thing. It's so stupid. But anyway, getting back to this, uh, Dustin seems like a cross between himself and Gold Dust. Did did you feel mm-hmm. that? He was doing like the shimmy shake thing jig too. Well, just the uh, stuff he said. And then we get this gem of him saying, suck it, duck it, quack, quack. <laughs> like, what the frick? Like, what uh, 
I think Booker T kind of borrowed that and modified it a little bit too. So well, it was it's supposed to be like shucky ducky quack quack. Like I've heard people, it's effing weird when they say it. I don't know what the hell it means, but people say it. Uh, mostly African American people, but like, what the hell is suck it duck it quack quack? What the frick? I do like that he did that thing. Like <laughs> yeah, I know he does that, and it's it's just ah, like dude, you're not Gold Dust anymore. You're Dustin Rhodes. Well, that's Whatever. not fun. Yeah. I love Dustin, but Goldust is, like, one of the greatest characters in history, so. I know, but it's I like, I feel like. I might be sarcastic, by the way. People might think I, that, but I'm not. I feel like he found the sweet spot now with his, his Dustin Rhodes character not exactly being Goldust. Just literally half. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, back then he was, he was, like, still trying to do Goldust, but not do Goldust. I have Jasper figures of him, too. Oh, wow. Nice. I haven't gotten him yet. Then again, I haven't seen, besides the Kenny Omega, I haven't seen any AEW figures out in the wild yet. So my my area is just a black I've, hole. I've literally bought four, sent three to you. <laughs> yeah. All right. But this one is Raven versus Dustin Rhodes. It went for just shy of eight and a half minutes. Raven rolls through with an ankle lock, sending Dustin into the corner. And then he rolls him up with his feet on the ropes for a three count. 411 Mania hated it. They gave it one star. I said it was slightly below average, I gave it two. What say you? Yeah, I hated it too. I gave it one, which is weird, because I like both these guys. <clears throat> I just thought it was terrible. Yeah, they didn't, I, I didn't feel like they had great chemistry in the ring. Dustin, I, he was just kind of there. However, Raven, I just, this just reminded me that I miss Raven. <laughs> That's all it really did. He was really good right here. The, the whole skirt wearing thing was a little odd at the time, but you know, whatever. It was unique. He wore it long enough to get a figure, by the way. You notice that? <laughs> I have that figure, yeah. <laughs> and he he used to paint stuff on his chest, like pain and whatever. He, he would always have different stuff painted and on his chest. And he looked like he always bought his t-shirts at Hot Topic, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looked like. <laughs> <laughs> that was back before every, like, uh, you know, disgruntled teenager that uh, is like, oh, nobody understands me, you know, used to shop at Hot Topic. And back before they used to sell wrestling T-shirts, by the way, this Raven was he still had it on the mic. His wrestling was still pretty good. I just I miss I miss Raven. But after the match, Raven brawls with Dustin before locking him in a straight jacket that was conveniently placed under the ring. Uh, Dustin tries to fight back, but Raven blasts him with a trash can and then uh, ties him up to the corner. Cassidy Riley now comes out to help, but Raven hits the Raven effect on him, uh, proving that he's dickless. And uh, Raven then whips Dustin until security comes out to chase Raven off. Man, Cassidy Riley was like the epitome of useless. I wonder what happened to him. Uh, yeah, I don't know. He probably works at the uh, gas station now or something. <laughs> I don't. I used to be a wrestler. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he maybe he did the typical wrestler thing and went into real estate. Seems to be but, a thing. Uh, right. Uh, didn't didn't this lead into he joined Raven as like his disciple? Yeah, I think it was him and Mike, Matt Bentley, right? Oh, Michael Shane. Mm, or... No, he came later in Serotonin. Uh, but it was I think it was just Cassidy Riley for a bit, and he started dressing goth or whatever. I don't know, but either way, I, that's the only thing I remember from Cassidy is you know he was a perennial jobber. He was just like they kept trying to do something with him, but he was just kind of. Blah. I don't know. But anyway, the lights drop in the impact zone before we get a vignette for Triton. Who Oh look, yes. Who look like Mini Brockus. And he will be debuting this week on Impact. Don West, by the way. And just, also he's gonna last for about three weeks. And yeah, I know. They hyped the crap out of this guy and then blah, flop. Much like Brockus. But Hey Brockus Don, was in the uh, the What's that thing called again? Brawl, uh, for, Brawl all. for All? Yeah. Well, Don West gets way too overhyped about this. I I don't know if you noticed that. Like, I realize his whole job... is redundant. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I realize his whole thing is to get hyped and, and stay hyped. And stay hyped. <laughs> but I don't like he just like, did that. <laughs> like, he's just like, he's doing the hands in front of him like he's about ready to choke somebody. And like, he's shaking. And he looks over at Mike Tanay. And and he's just he's yelling at Mike today about Triton. And it's like, dude, c- calm me up down, man. It's not that big of a deal. 
But, didn't, he do, uh, didn't he do an F5 called it the T6? Yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot everything about this guy. Like, literally everything. I did, re- I, and I also forgot that his theme song later became that of the British Invasion. <laughs> did, did you notice that? I did, yeah. Because the theme hit, and I was like, whoa, British Invasion? And I'm like, oh, no, it's Trayton. I think they started a few with him and Monty Brown, and then just ended. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, what the hell was with? Did they not see this guy wrestle? And they're like, ah, he's huge. He, you know, that, that'll be great. We'll hype him up. We'll throw him out there. And then they, then they're like, wow, he sucks. Never mind. I mean, that sounds let's like a Mister Russo. Let's thing give him to some do. credit for knowing, you know, that he sucked before doing anything more with him. Yeah, this does seem like such a Vince Russo thing to do. And it's like, ah, who cares if he can wrestle, bro? He's huge. Bro, he, he wrestles. Throws- Nobody cares about wrestling, bro. Yeah, no, nobody tunes into a wrestling show to watch wrestling, bro. God, that's so stupid. <laughs> but now, now we get a promo package for Kid Cash and Lance Hoyt going through the tag team division to get a shot at America's Most Wanted's NWA tag team titles. By the way, I didn't realize that between the last pay-per-view and this pay-per-view is when they changed his name from Dallas to Lance Hoyt. Yeah, I don't know why. My only guess is they got in trouble with some, uh, uh, trademark issue. What's funny is I'm thinking that, you know, the, the, whoever produced the show Dallas probably was like, ah, we have trademark. Yeah, for that. Exactly what I thought. Not the city of Dallas. Yeah. yeah right. They're like, I'm oh, pretty sure city names thing. are, are open or yeah. game. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're not trademarked. So that leads us into America's most wanted Chris Harris and James storm defending the NWA world tag team titles against kid cash and Lance Hoyt. This went just shy of 12 and a half minutes. I'll tell you what, man, I miss America's Most Wanted and forgot how awesome they were. In my opinion, at one point, they were the best tag team on this planet. At one point. Oh, yeah, for sure. And they they were one of the reasons why I loved watching TNA. And it just, I don't know, they split them up. And obviously they they did, well, James Storm did good stuff on his own. And people love to remember Beer Money because, I mean, obviously they were awesome. And TNA had bigger exposure at the time. But man, AMW was so effing good. But it's anyway, funny looking back at it, I thought always thought that if they broke up, Chris Harris was gonna be the one. And they had, acted like he was. Yeah. I I mean they pushed him, and then he gets an offer from WWE, he jumps, and apparently he got paid early and sat at home doing nothing but spending that paycheck on food. Because Lord. he showed up overweight in a singlet. And better, they called him Braden better, Walker. Or watch your mouth. They'll knock your brains out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right after he stands at the top of the ramp with his hands on his hips. Like a boss. F, yeah. I don't know, man. And then remember when he showed up randomly in TNA for like one match to go against Beer Money? Yeah, he teamed with Matt Hardy, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, when he showed up, I was like, at first I was like, whoa, it's Chris Harris. I'm like, whoa, it's... uh. <laughs> He ate Chris Harris. <laughs> I like. I thought he was out of out of shape as Braden Walker. Uh, I ain't seen nothing yet. And they buried him. And uh, Beer Money made fun of him in their promos. And yeah, so good stuff. But this match here, man, uh, it, it, it it's weird because Chris Harris was in phenomenal shape here. I mean, he was like pretty damn swole. But, Big swole. Uh, now don't even bring her up. <laughs> Just don't know. <laughs> Uh, That's a nominee for worst wrestler on the planet right there, man. You don't say. Worst promo, too. (laughs) Uh, Chris Harris ends up handcuffing Kid Cash to the corner, you know, like a real baby face. And AMW connects with the death sentence on Hoyt for the win. Uncle Dave actually rated this match. He gave it three and a half stars. I didn't like it quite as much. I gave it three. What say you? I gave it two. I I liked it, but it was like, this is not what AMW is capable of. Yeah, I I don't know. I went back and forth. Like, I, I was like, is it two and a half? Is it three? It's like, eh, whatever. I'll give it three. I really didn't think it was all that great. I don't know why Uncle Dave loved it so much. Maybe it's because of everything we'd seen up until this point. That just blew him away. Yeah, right. I, also, going back to the founder of youth, man, Lance Hoyt. <laughs> yeah. You know, Another one that's look like he's aged a day. <laughs> yeah, I know. He looks better now. Nuts. I mean, his his hair doesn't, but that's, you know, beside the oh, point. Oh, screw you. That's part of the whole thing, of the appeal of him. 
I know it's a unique look. He's it's just like a, I don't know if you've been following, but he's coming like a top baby face in AEW, so that's good for him. It's he was so good. Did you follow any of his stuff when he was in New Japan? Really working this I gimmick? I followed it, but I like knew of it. He was so damn good. He would come. I always loved. He would come out to the ring, grab a. He would he would have a water bottle. And he'd take a big swig and spit all over everybody at ringside. <laughs> he he was so he'd go up to the young boys, just spit in their face. I'm like, damn. Yeah, give him a disease because you know it doesn't matter. Everybody dies. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's not going to do it now. <laughs> and he used to have Shotzi Blackheart's helmet, so yeah. there was that. But getting back to this, a big no, black you don't. limo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> A big black limo pulls into the parking lot, and Shane Douglas is prevented from seeing who is inside by a group of emaciated homeless guys. I mean, uh, security guards. Good lord. <laughs> Again, don't at me. I, I didn't say it. Come on. I mean, look at these guys. They, who the hell are they going to stop from doing anything? <laughs> like, good grief. Like, you always make jokes about my size every week on the podcast. They couldn't stop me from getting through the front door well they look they were in universal and they probably asked hey do you want to be on tv to some of the random guests <laughs> uh, wow yeah I, I was just like i'm like this is seriously the best you can get and then you got shane douglas who is not a big guy but he's you know a decent sized wrestler um so i was just like what the hell but so i know was he hurt by the way because i feel like I think uh, he just stepped away. He was going up to this. He was only an announcer. Yeah, he. I think he just stepped away from the ring I, and he I wanted to try like, something else. I liked him in this role because he was like an aggressive announcer. He wasn't <sighs> some prissy little announcer like like scared to ask questions. He got in their face. So, I mean, it worked. I liked it. And, and, see, I went back and forth on it because like stuff like here, I don't know. Like there were some times I was like, oh, okay, I, I believe it. But I don't know. I said because in my notes I said he was such Douglas was such a good like natural heel. But I feel like he fit this role about as well as Dave Meltzer would fit being called a ladies' man. Wow. <laughs> I would not go that far. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There were times that I was like, okay, I buy it. I, I feel like I really got into Shane Douglas in TNA after, unfortunately, after um, the passing of uh, uh, Candido when he stepped up to, to manage the, the Naturals. I did not like the newly franchised Naturals, but I like Shane Douglas's character work. And now we get a recap of Abyss and Jeff Hardy beating the crap out of each other with weapons throughout the entire Impact Zone on previous weeks of Impact. That leads us to Full Metal Mayhem. And this is Abyss versus Jeff Hardy. It's Full Metal Mayhem for a contract for, the, for an NWA world title match. It went just shy of 15 and a half minutes. <sighs> this stipulation. By the way, I'm going to point out something real quick. The winner of this never got their shot. Ever. Seriously? It never went anywhere. It was forgotten about. It was a running gag wow. amongst me and uh, another friend I used to talk to. It's like, when the hell is, I'm not, I want, well, you know who wins, you know, 16 <laughs> years old. Like, when the hell is Jeff going to get his title shot from Against All Odds? He never did. Ever. Oh, no, Jeff, Jeff did not win his, the contract here. We'll get, we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah, so the whole thing of this. Oh, wait, that's there... another one. Okay, so there's two. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there there are two envelopes. This is the gimmick of the match besides the full metal man. There are two envelopes hanging above the ring. Sorry, not to One, catch off, but that's a TNA staple too. A I match know. with multiple things hanging, whether yeah, it be from one, a ladder, on a pole, whatever. Multiple things. Yep. That's... One has nothing in it. One has a contract for a world title shot in it. And this was when did they first started start doing uh, Money in the Bank? This year. This, okay, so. This WrestleMania, right, like the month or two after this? Wait, so, so WWE ripped off TNA? How dare I it? don't know, because <laughs> I know Jericho announced it on Raw. I don't yeah. know which Raw, though. So that, that one I have to go back and see, but I know he said it on Raw, so. Yeah. Well, this was also one on one. The whole idea of Full Metal Mayhem, by the way, was basically. Okay, it's. it's started, TLC. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was their version of TLC without calling it TLC. And the way they used tables was like such a loophole workaround because they were like, <laughs> well, the tables have a metal frame under the wood. Okay. Look, can we give credit to Don West for coming up with that though? I mean, stupid as it is, at yeah. least they try to give an explanation. You got to give credit for that. But here's my thing. They're like, anything metal is legal. 
Okay, so if I hit somebody with a baseball bat, am I disqualified? Yeah, right. They didn't specify that. Yeah, I was just like, what's to prevent somebody from saying, F it, everything's legal? <laughs> it just, but yeah, they use tables, ladders, chairs, and chains, and barbed wire, and thumbtacks, and every freaking thing else you could possibly come up with that was semi-metal. But yeah, so early in the match... No metal sta- music, though. I'm just let down, but... Good lord. That would be hilarious if they just played metal music like it was a New Jack match. Oh, good like, God. Metal- I just pictured it. Sorry, I'm I'm sorry I said that. But early in the match, Abyss stacks up four tables outside the ring, foreshadowing the end, because, you know, that's always how it goes. <laughs> it's a hardy yeah. thing, too. Don't keep that in mind. <laughs> At one point, see, when Abyss stacked him up, I thought he was going to do his typical trip over his own dick and fall through his own, you know, <laughs> erector set. But at one point, Abyss overhead belly to belly's hardy over the top rope. Supposedly it was going to go through a table. <laughs> but he he doesn't he doesn't make it. Hardy's feet go through the table, and the rest of them smacks hard on the outside padding. This is a Big Show WrestleMania 28 style. Yeah. Or no, uh, after WrestleMania 28. Sorry, at the pay per view after. Yeah. <sighs> but they set up another damn table on the stage. Jeff makes Abyss lay on it. You know, not because he, he hits the. He, he hits the twist of, of stun, I'll say, and Abyss just, like, pops up and then just, like, gingerly lays back on really, the table. sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... And I love Jeff Hardy, you know that, but, man, that move sucks. Yeah. But Jeff goes up to the... the where the, the little Tron is up top. They have, like, a little ledge. Climbs up onto the ledge, and then... I'm not even going to say he swantons off it, because he doesn't. He just kind of grabs it, and he front flips over it. Uh, on top of Abyss, through the table, somebody in the notes said, or the, the, in a review that I saw said, uh, yeah, Don West sold this like it was his, uh, WrestleMania 17 spot. It's like, not even close. This is one of the more iconic shots that you see in, like, every TNA highlight package, so. Yeah, it was, I mean, don't get me wrong, this was, you know, kind of cool. Uh, I mean, Hardy I wouldn't get, do it, so, I mean. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, Hardy gets off, uh, or gets one of the two envelopes. It's empty. Uh, Abyss sends Hardy over the top rope through two out of four tables that were stacked up because he just couldn't do it. And Abyss finally gets up and he grabs a contract. He gets the the title match. There you go. Uh, 411 Mania gave this one and three fourth stars. Their review was a little rough. They said they seen this kind the same kind of stuff in backyard wrestling matches. I gave it two two stars because it was semi entertaining. What say you? I gave it two for the exact same reason. Yeah, uh, it's all coming back to me, but I think Jeff Hardy wins that contract from Abyss somehow, and then doesn't get his shot. Wow! God dang it, opportunity, pal. My mistake. <laughs> yeah, this just why I don't know. I will say I forgot, like you know, because I remember Abyss in later years. Abyss was in phenomenal shape here, like. He he was uh he was slim and trim at this point. I mean he was still large, but you know he was he, and in he charge. Was yeah, and he hadn't got his teeth knocked out yet. Who, who the hell was it that knocked his damn teeth out? Rob yeah. Van Dam, wasn't it? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I think it was on like one of his first nights there. Yeah, that goes back to uh, you know Con- Conrad Thompson talked about he he went into the locker room for a raw one time with uh with Ric Flair and. uh Somebody said they were wrestling Rob Van Dam that night. Mark Henry goes, oh, man, get your mother hands up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'll always remember that. But after the match, Hardy beats up an in, it beats up on inanimate objects in frustration. He looks like he needs an ice bath and some massage therapy after this one, man. <laughs> this this was during the time where every single week he limped out to the ring holding his hip. Your I chronic thought, limp. I thought for sure he was going to need hip surgery, and he still might. I mean, there's time for that, but he looks he like he might have already had it too. He's had multiple. I uh, did he? I didn't. I didn't know yeah. he ever had hip surgery. No, multiple surgeries. I don't know if it was. Oh, hip. okay. Yeah, I thought. Uh, I thought for sure he was going to have to get a hip replacement after a while, because like, damn. But we now get a video package of Scott Hall having Team Canada help him beat up Monty Brown, but then DDP helps out Monty Brown, and this leads to this next match. <laughs> That uh, Scott Hall is not involved in. So, 
Yeah, he had already uh, no show and was done. Yeah. Stop, that time? stop me if you've heard that one before. <laughs> right. You remember that time that uh, Samoa Joe went off on him on a live mic for no showing? And then supposedly uh, Kevin Nash smacked him across the face in the back for doing that. Yep. I remember uh, WrestleCon when we went to in uh, New Orleans. I was like, oh, my God, Scott Hall is actually here. He didn't no-show, so I had to get that autograph quickly. <laughs> yeah, I think his no-showing days are over, but I could be wrong. Either way, this next match, Bobby Roode and Eric Young. Yes, I said those two names. <laughs> They're with Coach Scott Demore and Johnny Devine. <laughs> They're taking on the wacky-ass team of Monty Brown and Diamond Dallas Page. This goes 9 minutes, 43 seconds. Uh, this is kind of what I said to you the other day. Where you know, I said it's funny to see Eric Young here as small, bland, Canadian guy number four. And 16 years later, he's a tattooed, bald psychopath. Yep. And meanwhile, here, Bobby Roode is the jock that your daughter has a crush on. 16 <laughs> years later, he's the guy who's about to become your stepdad, and he frequently calls you champ and sport. <sighs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Especially when he had that effing mustache. That one looked creepy as hell, man. He had like yeah, a, he, he had like he a Tom looked, Selleck vibe going on. I know. He wanted to call him Richard. He looked like he, he wanted to sit you down and have like a, a heart to heart with you. It's like, look, pal, I'm not trying to replace your dad. <laughs> but I but I am. <laughs> yeah, right. Just in your mom's bed. Anyway, anyway, uh, once DDP gets the hot tag, business really picks up here. Monty Brown hits the bounce on Bobby Roode. That's how you got to say it. You got to say it like that. Uh, and then DDP hits a diamond cutter on EY off the middle rope. He gets the pin. Uncle Dave gave this three stars. I wasn't quite as impressed. I give it two and a half. What say you? I gave it two. I didn't hate it, though. It was just... I thought it was fine. This could have been on impact, is what I said. <laughs> yeah, it definitely could have. They wanted to get DDP on the pay-per-view. That was my excuse. And I'm just like, why? I mean, the crowd was obviously into it. He was still going, doing the whole running into the crowd and posing with him kind of thing, which was cool. Uh, he had a version of his, his old WCW scene back, which made me happy. So I liked it all. Uh, I did kind of wonder. I was like, why are you wrestling in a shirt? You're in phenomenal shape. Yep. It's kinda, but I, then again, I always used to say the same thing about Sting. I'm like, OK, first of all, you're in a singlet, so it covers most everything anyway. And second of all, like most guys your age would kill to be in that kind of shape. And yet you're wearing a T-shirt in the ring. Like, Maybe they have a high a, standard. I guess. Yeah. It's like Ric Flair when he was like, oh, I'm out of shape. I got to wrestle on a T-shirt on the last Nitro. Like, <laughs> like dude, eh, just, yeah, the, the Ric Flair and TNA says, hold my beer. <laughs> wow. But I feel like they cut away from their celebration in, like, two seconds. They're like, yay, they won. Pose. Go to the back. Like, they completely... did that a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's probably a Russoism. I've heard he loves quick camera cuts, so. Yeah, that was one thing. I used to listen to, um, like, old reviews of TNA shows, and the guy I listened to, that was his major gripe. He's like, we have this big victory. Yay, the baby face he overcame. Yay, let's go to the back. <laughs> like, what the hell, dude? Like, Because nobody wants seconds. to see wrestling, bro. Yeah, it's like, at least give him a few minutes to pose. Like, for God's sake. <sighs> but, yeah, it just kills the mood. We go to the back for another stupid segment at Dusty Rhodes' pickup truck. Another redundant comment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but Dusty isn't here. This time it's just Tracy and Trinity arguing with each other over who, who gives a crap until Jeff Jarrett's lawyer and Larry Zabisco come up looking for Dusty. The women tell him to get lost, and then Trinity tries to moon him, and uh, uh, Tracy Brooks puts her cowgirl hat up in front of her ass. So it's like, he's like, oh, Trinity, put that away. Like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> no respect for the me. fans. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? But anyway, from the outhouse to the penthouse, man, here we go. It's the phenomenal AJ Styles, Chibi AJ Styles. He's defending the NWA X Division title against the fallen angel Christopher Daniels. It is a 30-minute Iron Man match. It actually goes for 31 minutes and 37 seconds. So you can kind of assume when you see that that time code that it's not going to end, you know, in 30 minutes. But here we go, man. After Styles gets a 450 splash block, Daniels gets the first fall with the Angel's Wings for a pin. Uh, Styles 
ties it up when he reverses a back suplex into a roll up for a pin. Styles used to do some very innovative stuff. Uh, Daniels gets mad and he slams Styles' face into the ring post outside, busting wide open. Daniels locks in the Koji clutch, but time runs out. It's all tied up one to one. Daniels demands sudden death. Dusty Rhodes comes out of nowhere to make it official. Well, he demands that Dusty stop protecting AJ. <laughs> yeah. And then Dusty comes out of nowhere. I'm like, what? How do you get there so fast? I'm just going to assume he was in the uh, gorilla position or go position, whatever. But he comes out and says, you want sudden death? You got it. And they ring the bell. In the end, Daniels is thrown off a super hurricane Rana attempt. Styles goes for a middle rope Hurricane Rana, but they roll around for a bit until Styles gets into a Styles Clash. He nails it for the win. I said, this confirms to me that Daniels is Styles' greatest opponent of all time, John Cena being number two in my book. Uh, I gave it four stars. Uncle Dave gave it four and three four stars. What say you? I, I don't know how you don't give this match five stars. This is like one of the greatest professional wrestling matches of all time. I did I think love that it, yeah. it just. It's like everything that was right with TNA back in the day. Uh, yeah, if you could point to one highlight of TNA, these two were it. I think this match had everything, too, by the way. Like, everything you could want out of a pro wrestling match. It was really, it was really, odd. I mean, not to, you know, get, not, not to use a pun here, but, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it, it was phenomenal in many ways. I loved it. I loved the match. I loved these guys. I think it's a forgotten classic in in uh, TNA history. Yeah. It was that cool. iconic shot of AJ bleeding in the Koji clutch, by the way. Oh, yeah. These two, I mean, it's, it's cool to see these guys. I mean, like Daniels, like we said, hasn't changed much. But to see AJ from there to where he is now is nuts. It's like it's hard to believe it's the same guy. But, I mean, he's he's just always been great my only gripe with the x division if i had to put one out is like eric bischoff pounds this home on 83 weeks he's like what the f was it at the end of the day it was just their mid-card title <laughs> yeah well because he asked he said if i somebody asked would just people, say that it would have been fine right well yeah because he was like and i always ask it was like what is it and he said oh it's uh no no it's not about weight limits it's about no limits he's like yeah Cool, whatever. That's a that's a nice little ha uh, tagline, whatever. But what the f is it? And why should I give a crap? Yeah, I mean when you put it like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because he, he said you need to define if you're going to call it a division, division of what? What is the division? Is it small guys? Is it mid card guys? You know what the hell is it? I mean, it essentially, was small guys until Samoa Joe comes in like a couple months after this. That that's where it broke it for me, because I mean, don't get me wrong. I thought he belonged and I thought he did great with the exhibition. But my thing, I was like, what the hell is this big ass Samoan dude doing in the X division? Like, I thought the X division was like essentially the cruiserweights. And up until and that's then, it was. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I I thought Joe broke it. And then they started giving they started having like bigger guys compete for it. Abyss competed for it at one point. Scott Steiner. I mean, when they did the uh, whole... I think Kurt Angle held it. Yeah, Kurt Angle and Bobby Lashley both held it. It's just, you know, when they had the, the whole, oh, I hold every title in the entire company. That was effing stupid. Uh, but whatever. Uh, all in all, I enjoyed the X Division. Um, you know, this, up to a certain match point. This so. probably one of the best ones in history in that topped only in a couple of months by these two and adding uh, Smojo to it. I wish we could review Unbreakable, but I don't have I, – I can't find the full event anywhere. So and, I have uh, the match on the Best of Samojo DVD. I do as well. Yeah. So uh, – That, know, in I'm my a, opinion to this day, is probably the greatest wrestling match of all time. Yeah. I mean, I've always said that. Yeah, it's definitely it, – it, and it's most definitely the greatest triple threat of all time. I mean, that's not even up for debate. But I mean, uh, it would have been seven stars if it was in the Tokyo Dome, honestly. It was that good. Yeah. But outside of Jeff Jarrett's locker room, Jeff comes out and he asks his lawyer if he got the stipulation dropped. His lawyer says, I couldn't make it happen. So Jeff looks at Zabisco and he says, by any means necessary. And then he walks off. Smart Mark Sterling would have got that dropped, by the way. But... Yeah, <laughs> right. Give him a call. Uh, I will say um, I forgot about that T-shirt that Jarrett wore. I It was kind of cool. If For those that aren't watched, that didn't watch or don't remember 
it was uh, had a logo on it. That, it makes it look like uh, either the N- either NBA or, or MLB logo, but uh, the the silhouette in the center was him with a guitar. I thought That's that was clever. original. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. But uh, something that was not cool is what we're about to get into with the main event. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to take a quick break before we get into the recap and the match itself. We'll take our second to last break. When we come back, we will dive into all that is the main event for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on Twitter at main event underscore marks and on Instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector. It's the very best of professional wrestling's past every Monday on Retro Wrestling Review. I'm your host, Troy, and together we'll hop on my time-traveling wrestling ring and watch along to the greatest matches from yesteryear in the sport of kings. As complex, as controversial, and as brilliant, really, as he is. On Triple R, we'll cover matches from across the world, including American territories, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Fast action, lots more than that. You'll learn some things, find out about wrestlers and matches you never even knew about, and we'll have some laughs. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Retro Wrestling Pod. Retro Wrestling Review is available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, served up fresh every Monday morning. Unbelievable! The crowd! Absolutely stunned! The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we're back, and it is main event time, be it what it may. Uh, we now get a recap of the feud between Jarrett and Kevin Nash. We see Nash debut to help Hall, who Jarrett's been beating up. He's great when he debuts, and then he dyes his hair later on. So yeah. I, I just, did he see himself on camera and go, right. whoa? <laughs> uh, also... Like they announce him as big sexy in the match, but in the pro, like in the uh, the lead up, like promo, whatever they they say that Nash's nickname is now Big Monster. Yeah, because that's cool. Yeah, I was like, wait, what? And I was like, well, maybe Big Sexy is like copywritten, but no, they announce him as Big Sexy in the match, so I was like, whatever. But anyway, uh, Nash looks like he is sleepwalking through most of this, and he's just being paid enough to show up, but not being paid enough to give a shit. <laughs> did, yeah. did you get that feeling? I did. It's nice to see Jarrett giving his old WCW buddies like Hall, Nash, and DDP a place to get a paycheck after WWE is done drying them out, though. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be brutally honest with this. I don't even give a damn. I'm sorry. But we get into it, and I love Nash. Full disclosure, I am a huge Kevin Nash mark. Not so much Jeff Jarrett. Well, but. the thing with him is like he flat out admits that he does it all for money. So Yeah. They even when say, you say that, when you say that, we know you're not going to put forth an effort. So that's that's part of this whole program too. He's like, ah, I got a lot of money, but you know, I could always have more being the NWA t- champion. It's like, good lord! So you don't even give a damn. You're just, why am I supposed to cheer for you, or am I supposed to cheer for you? I don't know. Like, uh, my my whole thing too is like, yeah, well, how much money did you expect to get in TNA? I know it's T and frickin' A, like. They barely have a weekly shit. At this point, they were still on FSN, weren't they? No. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Then they'd yeah. be off in June and then on Spike in, in October. Oh, wow. And then they get Christian. So there you go. <sighs> but all right. Anyway, uh, it's Jeff Jarrett defending the NWA World Heavyweight title against Kevin Nash. This goes just shy of 20 minutes. Uh, you heard me right. Uh, Nash basically. You know what? Me. I want 20 minutes of these two. <laughs> right. Uh, Nash basically beats the crap out of Jarrett throughout the arena, busting him open. Jarrett makes a comeback since he can't, and uh, since he can't use a guitar, pulls out a case, and it's inside. It's got a fucking cello. <laughs> I was like, oh man, remember when Braun had the cello? Oh my god! I think I was at that event too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> god damn! Why? He's like, because I can't use a guitar. Reasons. I can't use a guitar, so logically, I got to go with another string instrument. Like, what it the couldn't, hell? It couldn't be like a violin, like something. Let's do we small, could, right? We could buy. 
Well, yeah, but I don't want to get ahead because I know what's what, where you're going to touch on here. But like that wouldn't have happened with the violin. Go ahead, keep yeah. going. Well, okay, let's let's just <laughs> let's just uh, get into it. He he's he's unzipping it from this big case. It looks like it could be a guitar case. I don't know. And you're just like, oh, and they're like, oh, he can't use a guitar. And I'm like, yeah, because you know he frequently brings his guitars to the ring in a case. That's always happened, right? Wrong. Well, he so obviously he's hiding something. Maybe a machine gun. I don't know. But he pulls it out, and it's a freaking cello, and he he shows it off so the the tiny ass little crowd can see it, and then he <laughs> drops it and breaks it in half. <laughs> Real quick before we go on, where do you get a cello like that? Dumb fucks are us. <laughs> Cause like hot damn, dude, like it just this was stupid on its face, and then you make it worse. <laughs> But he picks it up. He slams a cello into Nash's knee. These are words that I am saying right now. And then he he gets in the ring and he uses the cello case on Nash's knee because it looked like a soft case, but apparently not. He puts Nash's leg inside of it and then he keeps slamming it on the knee. Uh, but this isn't the end. Nash has more ass to kick. So Nash tries to use the cello, but the ref stops him. So Nash goes for the jackknife, accidentally knocks down the ref. He jackknifes Jeff Jarrett onto the goddamn cello. Uh, and then, formerly known as Billy Gunn in the WWE, runs in. and t- That's what they called him, by the way. He runs in. Because they had gotten sued for calling him the outlaw, by the way. On the DVD of this event that I watched, they clearly edited out. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, fuck. So was, yeah, but he runs in, and he takes out Nash with a chair to the face. But that's still not the end. More ass has to be kicked. So Six Why would that be the end? <laughs> I know, right? Six Pac runs in, and he beats up Jeff Jarrett. By God, Sean Waltman, Six Pac, he's here. Uh, he's a, what, what is Six Pac doing in the impact zone? <laughs> I'm sorry. I had, uh, but this is still not the end. <laughs> Formerly known as Billy Gunn is in the WWE, goes for a belt shot on Nash, and then what do you say about Three Life Crew, man? B.G. James comes in and stops him by pulling the belt away. Uh, but there is a belt shot. we got to be reminded of that. You know, I mean, not that it's bad, but got to remind him there was a history before this. You know, no, lest we forget. But uh, in the end, we get a belt shot, a stroke, another rep bump, a kick to the nuts, another stroke, and then Jeff finally effing pins Nash. What a bloated, overbooked hunk of shit. <laughs> 411 Mania gave it a fourth of a star. I gave it one and a half. What say you? Gave it one star. I just, <sighs> man, I forgot how many run-ins there were in this. This fucking sucked, dude. This was like, not that I w- wanted a clean-cut match between Jeff Jarrett and Kevin Nash that went for 20 goddamn minutes, but holy hell, man. <sighs> and I'm like, man, this was a match in 2005, not yeah. 1997. <laughs> this was Jeff Jarrett and it, like, this was a Jarrett Russo special right here. And then they kind of laid off it for a little while. And then when Magnus became the champion again, you remember they brought it back. Mm-hmm. I think was was Russo back to writing at that time? I don't think he ever left, despite them saying he did. He took some time off and then and then he, quote unquote, consulted. And then I think he came back for a while. uh, And that's when they got in trouble and got kicked off of Spike because Spike explicitly said no more Russo. And Dixie did it anyway, because, you know, oh, they're paying me a lot of money and helping out, you know, promote my my wrestling federation. Uh, That's nice. But I love Vince Russo. (sighs) That's a hill to die on. But. I remember yeah. <laughs> that was the thing when Magnus was a champion. It's like, oh, it's a title match with Magnus in it. You know, frickin' the locker room's got to unload. Yeah. This this just sucks. <laughs> this, this is why I said it suffered from the WCW problem, where their main events had, like, the star power and no substance, and the undercard was pretty good. Had substance, no star power. <laughs> yeah, right. But we'll take our final break. When we come back, we'll get to the final ratings of what's to come next week here on the podcast. Follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on Twitter at main event underscore marks and on Instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector. It's 
the very best of professional wrestling's past every Monday on Retro Wrestling Review. I'm your host, Troy, and together we'll hop on my time-traveling wrestling ring and watch along to the greatest matches from yesteryear in the sport of kings. As complex, as controversial, and as brilliant, really, as he is. On Triple R, we'll cover matches from across the world, including American territories, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Fast action, lots more than that. You'll learn some things, find out about wrestlers and matches you never even knew about, and we'll have some laughs. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Retro Wrestling Pod. Retro Wrestling Review is available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, served up fresh every Monday morning. Unbelievable! The crowd! Absolutely stunned! The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we're back with the final ratings. 411 Mania, because uh, IMDB, didn't, which I usually use, did not even cover this. Oh, that's not a good sign. <laughs> no. 411 Mania, which I've been using for a lot of my ratings, they uh, they did not like this. Uh, they, they gave it a 3 out of 10, which I was like, damn, that's a little rough. Cagematch.net gave it a 6.37 out of 10. I gave it a 6.5 out of 10 for, like, D minus. What say you? I think I'm right there with you at maybe a D plus, but the exhibition title match is worth a watch. The exhibition it title match was just phenomenal. Good lord. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the other cool thing is hearing Jeff Jarrett's theme. That's all I can say good about this pay per view. <laughs> Not Kevin Nash's theme. That sucked. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Jarrett that, had one of the best themes in all of TNA history, though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It's it's the Cody thing where it's like, well, if you're going to be helping to run the company, you might as well have one of the best themes on the <laughs> roster. Well, not anymore. You switch that stupid Snoop Dogg version. Fuck. Yeah, let's not uh, let's not talk about that. But <laughs> yeah, uh, Kevin Nash's theme, I think at the time was a it was a, an instrumental of a Dr. Dre song. I can't remember yep. which one. I think it's not still DRE. I can't remember which yeah, one they it all was. suck. But anyways, how dare you did this besmirch? The good name of the Dr. Dre. But anyway, uh, yeah, the exhibition title match, like we said, you know, definitely go out of your way to watch that one. It's amazing. The it's actually two- on some compilation discs, too, so you don't even have to watch this horrible paper. You'll find it. That's true. There you go. Yeah, I think they said that in the review of uh, uh, on 411 Media. They were like, well, at least that one's on compilation. They're like the best <laughs> the exhibition or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so they were like, so I can still see that match without having to watch this whole dog of a pay-per-view but uh, Bobby Roode and Eric Young versus Monty Brown and DDP was fun for what it was. Uh, AMW versus Cash and Hoyt was was fun. And uh, that's about it. The opening match was okay. Uh, not anything you should go out of your way to watch. Abyss and Jeff Hardy was fun for a garbage match. I don't know. All in all. I like both those guys, but yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. Uh, like I said, don't go way out of your way to watch it. It's just it's it's fun if you uh you know have like fifteen minutes to to waste. Other than that, yeah. But all right, man. That uh, you know what that does? That wraps up February for us. It's uh, the shortest month of the year. So there you go. There's uh February. I hope you go back in the archives. Last Friday we did drop uh, WWE No Way Out 2006, which was a very good pay per view. A sleeper. Go check that one out. Go out of your way. Uh, next week, though, we dive back into WWE. We are leading up to WrestleMania here in March. And what better way to celebrate that than with three really damn good WrestleManias? The first one on March 3rd. Next week, we are covering WWF WrestleMania 8, the Macho Flair Affair. And this was That's supposedly. A forgotten, this is a forgotten WrestleMania that had some really good matches. Yeah, I so, haven't seen it shame. in years. I remember getting it on uh, VHS, you know, for throw it in your Google machine, anybody born after the year 2000. Uh, but it was a... If you've ever heard the word tape. <laughs> yeah, tape, VHS, cassette, whatever. Yeah, it's uh, all them. But I remember renting this and loving it at the time. It's been years and years, obviously, because I said VHS. So I got to go back and watch it. Uh, Flair and Macho Man, uh, Hogan and Sid Vicious, or uh, Sid Justice, excuse me. It was supposed to be... My, uh, Hogan's like swan song. So he was supposed to go off to Hollywood to film some stuff. 
I mean, he came back. So. He did. He, he did go film some stuff. He did leave yeah. for a while, too, so it's not like... When did he go to film, anyway? I don't even remember what the hell it was at this time. I'm going to say it was Mr. Nanny. Was it? I get confused he about that. He might have been filming some Thunder in Paradise, too. That was... Yeah, that that sounds more like it. I know... Yeah, because I think uh, Eric Bischoff was talking about he, he had to meet him on the set of Thunder in Paradise to talk about some WCW stuff or to negotiate with him or whatever the hell. I don't know. I could be remembering it wrong, but uh, that's what it, where it is in my mind. But yeah, so WrestleMania 8 next week. Uh, I forget what year that's from. 90, 92? 92. Yeah, 92. So it was right after the greatest Royal Rumble in history, in my opinion. Well, I don't know. That was in Saudi Arabia, I think. I mean, Oh, oh my gosh. It's that, literally in the title. You shut your mouth. But anyway, yeah, so this was WrestleMania 8 came uh, came about, you know, after the greatest Royal Rumble in history, in, in most people's opinions, where Ric Flair won the WWF title. Now he's feuding with Macho Man. He's feuding, he's feuding with the Macho Man. And uh, Hulk Hogan is locked into a feud with Sid Justice after Hulk, that dirty, rotten scoundrel, pulled Sid Justice out to eliminate him unfairly from the Rumble. Yet somehow he's the baby face and Justice is the heel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, God, I hate Conrad for that. Kind of ruined everything. Uh, I mean, he's not wrong. Don't get me wrong. He's not wrong, but damn. Yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. And uh, oh, this there's is a also really the... good. There's a really good opener on this card too. It's not like amazing, but like Shawn Michaels and Tio Sinha is pretty damn good. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, those two names alone. I'm not being sarcastic. Those two names alone yeah. make me go take my money. So, I mean, not Tito Santana by himself, but he is a damn good wrestler. Uh, and then and uh, not... you said Piper and Bret Hart. Oh, Pi- oh, Piper and Bret Hart's on this card. Yeah, this is a this forgotten is... classic, man. Yeah, where Bret totally. bleed. Is that the one where Bret bleeds a gusher all over the damn ring? Yes. Yeah, I remember that because I, I remember seeing that. I'm like, oh, it was my a fun story about gosh. that when too, and record, when uh, talking about it. But um, yeah, and then there's a Virgil match. So there you go. It's all there. Right. Yeah. I'm very much looking forward to covering this this show though. It's it's. No, like Very, I said, I, I, I think it's a forgotten. I'm not going to say it's a classic. I don't want to throw that word around, but it's a forgotten WrestleMania that was pretty good. I'll say it's a classic. I think it's the first cons- like. I don't want to just throw that word around like candy, but it's no. It's close. But I think it's the first WrestleMania where more than just the main event really mattered. I yeah, mean, and also I, it takes place in a stadium. Unlike some people will have you think that WrestleMania 17 was the first one. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm not gonna reveal what they are yet, but we are reviewing two more WrestleManias this month because it is a five, well, a six show month because we got the bonus. Freaking bonus. The bonus of March is where we're gonna cover our next TNA show. And, uh, also, uh, next week, like I said, is WrestleMania 8 and Russell, and, uh, March 10th, the show after, Jake Grandi will be back on the show. We're gonna cover some ECW from 2000. He's saving Greg. Yeah, tell him for, thanks for laying on that grenade for me. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, he, he's excited to cover something besides classic WWF with me. So it'll be our first that uh, that we do that with. So he's excited. So Jacob Grandi from Curtain Jerkin is going to be back. And uh, right as we close the show, I uh, just want to remind everybody that we are sponsored by Fubo TV and Fanatics. If you're a real sports fan, you're going to want to click on the links down below in the podcast description. All. And don't forget to check us out. If you're not listening to us on Unhinged Sports Network, we're on live every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, right when AEW Dynamite NXT start on the East Coast. That's unhingedsn.com. Unhingedsn.airtime.pro is also the, uh, the other link you can use. And, of course, we drop new episodes every Wednesday on the podcast feed. We'll see you next week. Later on.